Hi and welcome to this OnMaths prediction for the Edexcel Paper 2 Higher Tier Maths GCSE. Enjoy! Hi and welcome to this prediction video from OnMaths. Now what this prediction is, is we look at all the previous exam paper questions and see what has comes up regularly and what's long overdue to come up and create this predicted paper. Um, you can do this predicted paper online for free if you click up here. And on our site also is Topic Busters, which is basically just specific topics with all the questions based on those. And we've got Topic Busters for every single topic. And you can also check out the Revisionator, which is quicker and shorter um, blast of random questions to help you revise. You can sign up for free. In fact, everything on our website is completely free. Um, please make sure that you use this as part of your normal revision. Don't just fully rely on this paper because it is a prediction. You need to just use this as a revision tool amongst all your other revision stuff. Don't forget also that when you do this online, the numbers will be different. The methods and questions will be the same, but the numbers will be different. So you can do it multiple times to see if you improve. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you do, please click like. And if you want to see more from us, please click subscribe. Thank you very much. Okay, so this question's about a adult, or an adult, and two children. So we've got David Smith and two children. So there's one adult and two children. But the prices shown are not quite right, because there's a discount. And there's a fifth off adult price and 30% off the child price. So let's work out the adult price first. So, a fifth off. Well, first of all, let's work out a fifth of £70. So, to work out a fifth, you can just divide 70 by 5. Now, I know that 10 fives are 50 and 4 fives are 20. So, that's going to be 14. So, that's going to be £14 he gets off. So, therefore, the price will be um, the... £70, take away the £14. Uh, so 70 take away 10 is 60, take away 4 is 56. So he's going to pay £56 himself. Let's do the uh, child price. Okay, so it's 30% off the child price. So we want to do 30% of £37. Okay. Let's do the equals down here to give us some room. Well, I know that 10% is going to be £3.70. And then I need to times that by 3. Okay, so I could just times it by 3. Um, let's, let's have a think. I could do 370. I could do it in pence and then just times that by 3. So 370. Um, and then I can just do times 3. So I can do a little grid. And if this is on the calculator, then obviously you just type it into the calculator. And obviously that's going to be zero, so we don't need that one. So that's 900. That's 21 with a zero. So 900 plus 21, 210 even. So zero, one, and then 11. So that's going to be 11 pound 10. And so we want to work out the price. So it's going to be uh, £37, take away £11.10. So if you take away 10, it's 27, take away 1 is 26, take away 10 is £25.90. Now that's for one child, so that's one child. So if I want two children, I want to do £25.90 times 2. Now I know 25 times 2 is 50, 90 times 2 is £1.80, so that's going to be £51.80. Okay, I'll move down a bit and let's do the total. So the total is going to be the adult price, which is this one here, plus the two children price, which is that one there. So I want to do 56 plus £51.80 
And again, if you've got a calculator, you can just type it in. But let's do the column method. Compound 80. And then people like putting the zeros in. So that's going to be 0, 8, 7, 10. So that's going to be £107.80. So it's £107.80. Finished. Okay, so this question is about Venn diagrams. And it says there's 37 students in total. Um, and it says 10 only like the red car. So 10 only like the red car. 9 only like the blue car. And 8 said they liked the red car and the blue car. So 8 in the middle there. And those are the values for A, B and C. And it says how many students uh, did not like the red or the blue car. So if we add all those together, we get 27. But there's 37 students in total. So if we take them away, we get the answer of 10. So, and we can actually show that on a Venn diagram on the outside like that. So it's finished my answers, 10, 8, and 9. Okay, it says, a student's chosen at random to discuss their views. What's the probability the student liked the red car? Well, let's have a look. There's 10 people who only like the red car, and there's 8 people who liked the red car and the blue car. So in total, that's 18 people who like the red car. Just 8 of them happen to like the blue one as well. And in total, there's 37 students. So it would be 18 over 37. Okay, so the main problem with this question is that people don't know what a frequency polygon is. If you know what a frequency polygon is, I think most people will get this right. Frequency polygon is uh, basically a line graph, but you plot these at the midpoints. So the first one's going to be plotted at 40. Uh, the next one, so you, if you don't know how to find a midpoint, you're just finding the halfway value between 0 and 80, which is 40. To do it a different way, you could add uh, the two values together and halve it, and that works just as well. So 80 plus 160 uh, is 240, and then halve it would be 120. Uh, 160 plus 240 is going to be 400. Harvard is 200. Okay, so we're going to plot these at 40, 120, and 200. Now, a different way of doing it is just plotting them halfway between the two lines. So we've got a line here and a line here. So we're just plotting them halfway. So it says frequency is 11. So looking at the scale, it looks like it's going up in twos. So that would be 12, 14, 16, 18, and 20. So that works. So we're going to plot it halfway between the two red lines that I've just shown. And it's going to be halfway between 10 and 12. So it's going to be about here. And they're quite forgiving. As long as you, as long as they um, understand the point you're trying to do, if you're slightly off it, they are quite forgiving with that. Okay, so 120 is halfway between 80 and 160. And it's going to be 18 tall, which will be here. And 100, so 200 is going to be up to 6. So let's plot these, 8, 6, 4, 2, and so 6 is going to be here. Now we haven't finished yet, we do need to join them up with straight lines. So let's just do that to finish off the question. And there we go, that is a frequency polygon. Whenever we see a 3D shape in a question, you've got to ask yourself, is the question asking for a volume, or a surface area and that should be the first question that goes into your mind yes it might be asking for something else but those are the main two we're looking at this we're filling the swimming pool with water so it's going to be a volume question now way of approaching this is figure out what the shape is well the shape is um, a um, trapezium based prism so we've got to first of all work out what the area of the trapezium is. So I'm going to draw the trapezium out first. And that height is going to be 2.7 that side, 5.3 that side, and 25 across. 
and I'll leave off meters because I know they're all in meters but do check they are all in meters when you do this so we've got so first of all work out the area now the area of a trapezium is half a plus b h now a and b are always the two parallel sides and then the height is the one that connects them at right angles so the height is going to be 25 there and all you're doing is working out the average of the two um, uh, bases, the 2.7 and the 5.3 We're going to times that by 25. Okay, so we'll crack our calculator out. 2.7. Some of you will probably see this straight away. So the first bit comes out as 4, because halfway between 2.7 and 5.3 is 4. And then times 25 is going to be 100. So the area is 100 meters squared. Now, for a prism, so volume, all you need to do is work out the area of the cross section, which is this bit here, the bit we just worked out, and then times it by how 3D it is. I think they call that the length officially, 15 meters. So the volume is going to be 100 meters squared times 15, which is going to be 1,500 meters cubed. So that's what the volume is, and it says the machine transports the water at a rate of 20 meters cubed per minute so in one minute it's going to be 20 in two minutes 40 the other way of working this out or the other way of thinking about this is how many 20s are there in 1500 so we can say time equals so this is how much it's got to fit, uh, got to fill and this is how much it does per minute. So on the calculator, 1,500 divided by 20, which equals 75 minutes. So it's going to take 75 minutes to fill the pool. OK, I understand the temptation in this question to say that the answer is zero. Please do not write that. Anything to the power of zero is not zero. Anything to the power of zero is one. Now you can think about this if you do x to the power of five divided by x to the power of five, then um, the rule is that you take away the indices when you divide them, so it's x to the power of zero. And we know that any number divided by itself is always equal to one. So the answer to this question is always going to be one just try and remember that anything to the power of zero is one okay so question a is about reverse percentages so in 2014 and 2015 well let's have a look so the sales went down between the two so if we start off with 100 percent and they went down 12 percent what we left with well we left with 88 percent now, as a multiplier, and this is the best way of doing this, 88% divided by 100, make it a decimal, is 0 0.88. Now, that number, 0 0.88, is what we times the 2014 um, sales to get 2015. But in this question, we're given the 2015 sales. So we're given this one here. So we want to work backwards. So what we want to do is we want to do, I'll get my calculator, 7,359 divided by 0 0.88. And that gives me uh, £8,362.50. You've got to ask yourself, well, is that reasonable? Well, they went down by 12%, so it's natural that they would go from a number around just over 8,000 to a number that's just over 7,000. So I'm going to write the answer, £8,362.50. OK, and the next question says that the sales went up in 2016, or they want to get, they have a target to get their sales up in 2016. What's the percentage increase? Now, percentage increase or percentage decrease, it's the same formula, is change over original 
times 100. So the change, well, that's going to be 12272. Take away the 2015 sales. So that's that one there. 7359. So they're looking for it to change by 4913, 4913. The original was at 7359, and we need to times by 100. So I'm going to divide that by 7359, times it by 100. And that gives me 66.7617, blah, blah, blah. So that's to the nearest percent, so that's going to be 67%. Okay, so for this question we need to work out the length of the arc, which is around here. And then we need to work out what this and this are. So we're going to do arc first. I'm going to show the examiner that I'm doing the arc first. Now the uh, distance of the arc is the um, total circumference of the circle times by the fraction of the circle we've got. So you want to work out what the fraction is of the circle and times it by the circumference of the circle. So to work out the fraction of the circle we've got, well we've got 146 degrees and there are 360 degrees in total in a circle. The formula for the circumference of the total circle is pi d or 2 pi r well, here we've got a radius because it's halfway across the circle. If you imagine the whole circle looks something like that, then the 37 is the radius. So we need to first of all double the radius to get the diameter, and so we're going to do pi times 74, which is twice 37. Okay, so we type that all into our calculator. So I press the fraction button 146 over 360 times pi times 74. And it gives me in terms of pi, I don't need it in terms of pi, I just need it as a decimal. So 94.2826, blah, blah, blah. Now that's for the arc length, but we also want to know what this distance here is. Well, we've already got that one. And what this distance here is. Well, they are both radiuses, or radii we call it. So that's also going to be 37 metres. So to work out the perimeter, I'm just going to get that 94.2826 blah blah blah, and I'm going to keep it in my calculator, and I'm going to add 37 and add another lot of 37, so add 37, add 37, and that gives me 168.2826 blah blah blah. Once it's two decimal places, so line goes down here, and we've got 168.28. Now just be careful that you add on the extra bits. When it asks you for a perimeter, just make sure you've gone the total distance around the shape. Put a dot and just draw with your finger around the shape to make sure you've got all the distances. Right, when working with bounds, the easiest way of answering the question or thinking it through is just to do a quick number line. Put the number that's been rounded in the middle and try and figure out what the next one down is. Well, it's to the nearest 5, so the next one down is going to be 80. Now, we could do the next one up, but it's asking for the lower bound, so we're only interested in the lowest possible values. Now, the next thing is to work out what the cutoff point was. Why was it rounded to 85 and not 80? At what point should, did it need to be higher then? Well, the point at which it needs to be higher is halfway between the two, which is 82.5. So that's our lower bound for the 85. Then just repeat the process for the 160. So we've got 160 in the middle. And the next one down would have been 155. And then when we draw the line, well, it's going to be 157.5. Now, to what many students would do is just look at the number. Well, the area is going to be 85 times 160, and that's what the area is going to be. But we know that the 85 could have been 82.5, 
and the 160 could have been 157.5 and that would give the lowest possible area so if we get my calculator out 82.5 times 157.5 and that gives me 1299.375 and it doesn't ask me to round it so I'm just going to write down the exact number now be careful with areas we're timesing them so we want them both to be small but if you were to divide them sometimes you actually want the l the upper bound of one of the values but for area you want them both to be as small as possible to give us the lower bound for the area okay so for this question understanding of the formula of a circle um, is critical so formula of a circle is x squared plus y squared equals r squared and um, so it looks very very similar to the equation given to us here so if I rewrite the equation given to us and instead of 4 I write 2 squared okay and that's a perfect match for the equation of the circle so we've got a circle with radius 2 so it's from the origin which is here let's do this in red it shows up and it will pass through it will have a radius of 2 now I don't have a compass but when you're doing this do it with a compass and you're going to see how rubbish I am at drawing circles that wasn't bad although I think it's just going to get worse it's probably the least pathetic circle I've drawn um, but use a compass in the exam measure out the, the, um, uh, the radius uh, on one of the axes and then just draw a circle and that's four marks. Okay, so in this question we're asked to enlarge shape A by scale factor minus two with the centre of enlargement two five. So normally we'd first of all put the um the uh, centre of enlargement on, but it's already done for us. So what I need to do now is draw my ray lines, but because it's negative we know they're gonna go through the centre of enlargement. So I'm gonna draw my ray line. Uh, I don't need to do the bottom right one because it will essentially be the same thing. And let's do this one. Let's try and get it as perfect as we can. So it should be something like that. Okay, now, next thing to do is count how many squares we went away. Uh, so I'm going to start with the bottom left point. So we've got one, two, three, four to get to the center of enlargement. So if it's minus two, we're going to go another four twice so one two three four one two three four so we end up here okay for the next one um let's do the bottom right one so we're going to go one two three four five six one two three four five six one two three four five six so we're just right on the edge there. Okay, let's do the last one. So this this time I'm going to count the diagonals. And if you had a ruler, you could just measure it out. So one, two, three, four diagonals. So one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Okay, and now we need to connect them all up. So let's connect them all up. and probably it will say label it B, yeah. So label it B. And always check the width of A was two and the width of B is four, so that's good. The height of it is four and so the height of B should be eight, which it is. And it looks unusual because for an enlargement you're used to it being the same way around, but for negative enlargement it basically just flips it. There are quite a few different approaches um, for this question. Um, one thing we can do is try and find length AD by using the cosine rule. Um, and the other approach which I'm going to use is I'm going to work out this angle here using the sine rule and then work out this angle here taking away from 180 degrees. Then when I've done that then I can use the um, trigonometric area formula. 
So I'm going to work out the fur the angle I marked first. So that is um, angle A D C. That's what I want to work out first. Now to do that, um, I'm going to call that. Um, let's call it X. So it's a bit easier to write. So I'm going to use the sine um, rule, and that says that sine x over so this is sine x this is x here so it's going to be over 8 equals sine 110 over 12 and the reason it has to be that way around is obviously sine matches up opposite angles and lengths so it's going to be those two and those two so first thing I'm going to do is just times both sides by 8 so it's going to be sine x equals 8 sine 110 over 12 and then what I'm going to do is inverse sine both sides scroll down a bit more so x is going to be the inverse sine of 8 sine 110 over 12. So let's get my calculator. So inverse sine, uh, fraction button, 8 sine 110. Close the brackets over 12, and then come out of the fraction, close the brackets. So that tells me that x is 38.789 blah blah blah. Now I want to keep the accuracy if I can so I'm going to keep that in my calculator and then what I'm going to do is add that to the 110 to work out what this angle here is and I'm going to call that Y so what is this ACD so I'm going to tell the examiner that ACD I'm going to call as Y just to make it a bit easier so Y equals 180 take away 38.789 blah 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 plus 110 so I'm going to add 110 to that then I'm going to type in 180 take away the answer so that tells me that y is 31.2104 blah 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 okay so I've worked out what y is which is good because when you have a length, then an angle, then a length all together, then you can use the um, trigonometric area uh, formula. And the formula is dead easy. It just says that area equals half AB sine big C. So we know we the problem is actually we've got two triangles we've got a triangle here and then we've got an identical triangle here and it is identical because the um, diagonal of a parallelogram cuts it in half exactly so what we also need to do is then times this by two now if we notice that the half and the times two will cancel so it's just going to equal AB sine C. Now I've kept that number in my calculator, so I can use it with A and B. A and B are going to be 8 and 12. So it's going to be 8 times 12 times sine 31.2104, blah, blah, blah. So let's quickly use the calculator before it switches off. So I'm going to press sign answer, close bracket, times 12 times 8. And it says the answer is 49.7455, blah, blah, blah. Let's have a look and see the accuracy that I need. One decimal place. So let's have a look. That's going to be 49.7. Now, if you didn't keep the numbers in your calculator and you rounded them, make sure you round them to four or five decimal places. So I would probably round it at least to three decimal places, but you normally want to go a little bit further. 
you might find that if you rounded it, you might get a slightly different answer to mine. Now, that's why you must show you're working out, because if you got, for, uh, say, 50 um, rounded to the nearest decimal place, or 49.8 or something, then if you can show you're working out, if you can show that you've done all of the steps, and the reason why you got slightly off was because you rounded some of your working out, you might get full marks, but you would get at least all but one mark for the question. There are a few different ways of answering this question. I'm going to show you what I feel is the easiest technique. Um, but if you've got a different technique, you get the same answer, then stick with it. Um, this question will all be about multipliers and understanding how to use them. But the difficulty in this question is we're finding out how long it will take um, to get to a certain point, um, which is a big twist in this question, and we're not given a quantity. Now, whenever you're not given a quantity, one method of being able to do it is by putting in your own quantity and the easiest quantity to put in is the number 100. So I'm going to pretend that the population of the town at the start is 100. Now this question as I said is all about multipliers so we need to figure out what a decrease of 6.5% as a multiplier is. And to do multiplier you start off with 100%, you do whatever the question is saying so this time we're decreasing by 6.5% and this will be on the calculator paper, so you might as well use your calculator to do 100 take away 6.5, and hopefully the answer is 93.5%. And to convert it into a multiplier, you just divide by 100. You're just converting it to a decimal, but the uh, paper will call it a multiplier. That would be 0.935. So whenever I time something by 0.935, I've decreased it by 6.5%. Okay, so we've got our 100. And what I want to do is figure out how many times I need to multiply it by 0.935. Okay, so there's a power here which we don't know yet. To get the answer um, that is less than 47% of it. Well, the reason I pick 100 um, as my uh, quantity I've made up is because 100 is nice and easy because 47% of 100 is 47 so we need it to be less than 47. Now what I do on my calculator is I type in 100 and I times by 0 0.935 and I get the answer of um, 93.5. Now what I'm going to do now, and that's one time, what I'm going to do now is press answer times 0 0.935 and what that will do is allow me to go through um, this same calculation as many times as I want by just pressing the equals button. So I'm going to press the equals button once and I get the answer of 87.42. So I've done twice in total so far and I can leave a little tally mark here. I press it again and I get 81.7. Again, 76.4. Again, 71.4. Again, 66.8. Again, 62.4, so I'm getting closer, again 58.4, again 54.6, again 51, I'm getting close, again 47.7, so I'm getting very very close but I'm not quite there yet, and I press it one more time and I get 44.6, so in total I've done it 12 times. Now, I'll, I'll always want to check that because my counting is not necessarily the best when under pressure. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do 100 times 0 0.935 to the power of 12 to check that I've got this right. So 100 times 0 0.935 to the power of 12 and I get 44 point, so 44.64. And I'm just going to check that that was uh, the first time it went under. So I'm going to do to the power of 11. And what I can do is just use just scroll through my working out on the calculator and change the 12 to 11. And press equal. And that's 47.744. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, and each of these are rounded. Okay, so it's going to take 12 years. Because 11 years gets us close but not quite over the line. It's the 12th year that it dips below 47%. Now, as I said, there are different methods. You don't need to include the 100 uh, as a made-up value. 
um, what you can do is just look at the multiplier and wait until the multiplier is 0.47 or below or sorry below 0.47 um, and the multiplier would go down to 0.4464 blah 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 and that's absolutely fine method um, and there are other ways of doing divisions which I'm not going to go into because you don't need to go that far um, because when you hit A level there's a much much better way of doing it but we don't go through it at GCSE um, if you wanted to look into it it's to do with logarithms but we won't go into that Now this topic is brand new to the GCSE. I don't think uh, it's ever been on the GCSE before so it could be that all the resources you're using are a bit rusty on it. The idea is that you capture some things and you mark them all, then you put them back into the population and then you capture a few more again. And then from that information, from the amount that you get back that are marked, you can guess or you can have a really great estimate of the total population size. So it's typical for things that you can't just um, get all the fish in a lake and just know how many there are. It, it's just going to be impossible because as soon as you count one of them, it swims off and it, you could count it again. And it's impractical to try and tag them all, um, especially with methods like capture recapture from Peterson that allows you just to calculate it and have some really great estimates for it. Now, the best way of doing it is to know the formula, and the formula is as follows. N, which is the population size, that's what we're trying to find out, is this, it equals M. Now, M is the amount of things that you marked and then released. So, on our example here, we marked 4. Times... N. Now that little n is the size of the recapture sample, which is 4 here, over little m. Now little m is the amount of things in your recapture sample that were marked. So in our little example here it's 2. So let's apply this to the question. Let's try and work out what m is. m is the amount of um, trout that we marked. So we marked 97, so that's going to be 97. N is going to be the size of the, the um, sample that we took again, so the 60, that's our recapture sample, that's the sample then we took a few days later or the next day, so that's 60. And we're going to divide that by the amount of those 60 that were tagged or that were marked which is 7 and so all you need to do is just type that into a calculator which I've got handy so it's 97 times 60 and then over 7 and now you always get um, well you some often get like a decimal so I've got 831.428 blah 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 now it says the number of trout, estimate the number of trout. So we have to have a whole number. So it's just going to be rounded to the nearest whole number. So that's 831. Okay, so this question looks quite simple, but actually it's going to take a bit of time to sort out. So first thing I'll do is do a little sketch. Uh, I'm going to do it up here. Um, since the y's are mainly negative, or in fact are negative, both negative, I'm just going to show the bottom of the graph. So at point 7, we're at minus 17, which I'm going to say is here. It's a sketch, so it doesn't have to be perfect. And at point 19, uh, we're at minus 11, which I'm going to say is here. Okay. This is called line AB. Now we're asked for the perpendicular bisector. Now perpendicular means it's going to hit that line at right angles. Bisector means it's going to cut it right down the middle. So I'm going to start off at the middle of the shape and draw a quick sketch there like that. Okay, I'm going to call um, um, I'm going to call this uh, M here, and I'm going to call this line line C just so I can uh, reference it in my work now and it makes it a bit clearer. Now um, there are two things I need to find out. 
uh, for, to find out the equation of point C. I need to find the um, gradient of point C and I need to find um, the y-intercept. The gradient is going to be the first thing I'm going to have to find and then I can work out what the y-intercept is and then um, write the equation of line C. So two things I need to work out uh, for line AB is the gradient. So the gradient is going to be change in y over change in x. So the change in y is minus 11 um, take away minus 17. And the change in x is 19 take away uh, 7. Okay, so uh, we've got minus 11 and then effectively plus 17, which is 6 divided by 19 take away 7 okay 19 take away 7 is obviously 12 so 6 divided by 12 which is a half so the gradient of that is going to be a half okay next I need to find um, the midpoint because we know that that's also a point on line C okay so the midpoint is going to be the um, average of the x's, so 7 plus 19 over 2, and then the average of the y's, so minus 17 plus minus 11 over 2. So we're basically just finding the halfway points. Now, obviously 7 plus 19 is 26, divided by 2 is 13, but you might have just noticed that 13 is halfway between 7 and 19. Um, same with the others, obviously um, we could do the same thing, um, halfway between the two of them is going to be minus 14. Okay. Now, you might be wondering, well, why did we find the gradient of line AB? Well, perpendiculars have a kind of weird connection where if you multiply both their gradients, it equals minus 1. Now, the way we use this is to convert um, a gradient to a perpendicular gradient, we do two things. We find the reciprocal of the gradient and we times it by minus 1. So to find the gradient of line C, what we're going to do is flip it. So the reciprocal of half is 2 and times it by minus 1. So it's going to be minus 2. Now a way of checking that is if you multiply the two gradients together, you should equal minus 1, which a half times minus 2 is minus 1. So we've got the gradient. Now we know um, that the a, a formula for the equation of line C is y equals mx plus c. We actually know the gradient and we know a point on that line, which was the midpoint of line AB. So we're going to feed in the um, coordinates. So it's minus 14. We know what the gradient is, minus 2. I'm going to put this in brackets. Times the x coordinate, which was 13, plus c. And we just solve this to find out what c is. So minus 14 equals, and that's going to be minus 26 plus C. I'm going to add 26 both sides. And if this is on the calculator, then obviously always use your calculator to be sure. So it's going to be 12 equals C, or C equals 12. So therefore, the, uh, the equation is, in the form y equals mx plus C, it's going to be y equals minus 2x plus 12. Okay, so this question is involving a probability tree diagram. And if we read the question, it says that the counter's not put back in the bag. Therefore, we know it's going to be conditional. Now, conditional means that the probability of the second uh, um, event, so taking the second counter, depends on what you did the first time round. Okay, the way uh, probability trees work is you start on the left-hand side, and you have an option. You can either go up, if you pick blue or down if you pick red. Now because you have to pick one of the options, the two options have to add up to one. So if blue is three over seven, the bottom one must be four over seven, has to be, because then it adds up to seven over seven, which is one. Now if we picked a blue on our first counter, the probability of us picking a blue again is two over six. So therefore the probability of us picking a red will be 4 over 6. 
OK, now let's see where those numbers have come from. It says in the question that there are three blue counters and four red. Therefore, the first probability of a blue being 3 over 7 is because there's three blue counters and there's seven altogether. The second probability, so if I picked a blue on the first counter, went down, well, if I picked a blue again, to 2 over 6. That's because there's two blue counters and only six left altogether. So we need to know that to be able to fill out the bottom one. So if I picked a red on the first time round, what's the probability I'll pick a blue? Well, let's have a think. There are still three blue counters in there, but there are only six left altogether um, left in there because we've picked a red. So, the probability of us picking a red, well, there were four before we picked one, but we've picked a red, so therefore there are three reds left and six left altogether. Now, I'm deliberately not cancelling these down. I could cancel it down to a third two-thirds, half, half. But I'm just going to leave it as it is for now, just to make things simpler. OK. Question B says, work out the probability that the two counters picked are different colours. So let's follow our routes along. I'm going to go up and then up. So blue and then blue. Blue and then red. Red and then blue. And you're always starting from this point here. And then red and then red. Now, let's have a look. Blue and blue are not different colours, so we're not interested in that. Red and red are not different colours, but the middle two are. So, what you do with probability trees is you start here and you collect all the fractions that you went past on your way, on your journey to the end. So, we went past 3 over 7 and 4 over 6. Now, the word and there is really important because and in probability means times you're always going to multiply them when you're going across a tree diagram. So I'm going to times the tops and times the bottoms. Again, I'm not going to bother cancelling down at this point. OK, so the other option is I pick a red first and then a blue. So that is 4 over 7 and, mean times, 3 over 6. That's going to be 12 over 42. And normally these two will be the same. OK, so just be prepared for that. Not always, though. OK, so we had 12 over 42 for the first option and 12 over 42 for the second option. But we can't pick both options, and this is the problem. We've got two probabilities, two answers. Well, we can't possibly have that. The word or comes into effect here. We either pick a blue and then a red or a red and a blue. And the word or in probability means add. So all we need to do to finish this question is add the two options we had. So when you're going down here and you're collecting all the fractions you got, you just add them together. So we're going to add the tops together, which is 24 over 42. So it's half top and bottom, and let's, let's cancel it down now. It's 12 over 21, and I think I can divide them both by 3. So it'd be 4 over 7. So my answer is 4 over 7. First thing I do with this question is just write the numbers out. They're a bit small in the question. Now with all sequences, we're interested in what it goes up in. So we're interested in what these go up in. So if you've got a calculator, you can just do 25 take away 13. If it's on the calculator paper, then you can just quickly do it in your head. And I'm going to do this for a few of them. Now, you might notice straight away that the next one goes up in 18. Well, let's have a look at the next one. That goes up in 24. And the last one goes up. in 30, which is what we'd expect. So they're not going up by the same amount. Now when they don't go up by the same amount, we need to have a look at the second difference. If they don't go up by the same amount in the first difference, 
that means it's not going to be an arithmetic sequence. We're not going to use the standard linear nth term, the one that you're probably used to. For a second difference, it's going to be a quadratic. Let's check to see if there's a second difference. So that's add 6, this is add 6, and this is add 6. So we know it's a quadratic sequence, so it's going to involve an n squared somewhere. Right, the step that people have difficulty with is you get the second difference and you halve it. And that's all you've got to do. Now, that halving, the dividing by 2, won't ever change. You'll always halve it and you get the number 3. This 3 is going to be the coefficient of the n squared. So I can fill that into my answer now. Now the problem is we don't know what else we need. What we need to do is write out the sequence 3n squared. So let's uh, number the terms. So we've got the first term, second term, third term, fourth term, and fifth term. And so we've got our, our sequence which is, I'm just going to copy this out again, 13, oh, I'll write 35, it's 25, 43, 67, and 97. And we're going to write out the 3n squared, which we've just discovered. Now, that means we just square the sequence number and then times by 3. So 1 squared is 1, times 3 is 3. 2 squared is 4, times 3 is 12. Uh, 3 squared is 9, times 3 is 27. 4 squared is 16, and times that by 3 is going to be 48. 5 squared is 25, times 3 is 75. Now what I want to do next is I want to subtract them. I want to subtract the sequence... Uh, I want to do the sequence, take away the 3n squared. We know that 3n squared is a part of it. We need to just take it away so we know what's left. So 13 take away 3 is 10. Uh, 25 take away 12 is going to be 13. 43 take away 27 is going to be 16. 67 take away 46 is going to be 19. And 97 take away 75 is going to be uh, 22. Okay, now we end up with a little sequence here. Okay, we've got 10, 13, 26, uh, sorry, 10, 13, 16, 19, 22. Now we find the difference in that. So that's a plus 3, plus 3, plus 3. Now that's a linear sequence. Now we've got to find the nth term of it. So to do that, we find the zeroth term. So we go back one, we subtract three, and that tells me so I'll say linear. So that's going to be a seven. So we know we're going to add seven. And we know it goes up in three, so it's going to be three n plus seven. So, we've got our 3n squared already, and we just need to add 3n plus 7. So the first thing you need to do is find out what the quadratic sequence is, the quadratic bit of it, the squared bit. Then you've got to find out what the linear bit of it is, and then just add them together. Okay, so this question seems really complicated because the just sheer amount of words, but actually it's quite a simple question um, when you get your head around it. So um, the first question we're looking at uh, a bag or two bags of letters um, and one bag of numbers, and so there are 26 letters in the alphabet. So there's 26 options for this first bag. There will be 26 options for the second bag. And uh, numbers from 0 to 9. Now, we've got to be careful here because 0 is counted. So there are 10 numbers in that bag because there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. But there's also 0, so that's 10 in total. And to get the amount of combinations, all we do is 26 times 26 times 10. 
and we will have a calculator for this so 26 times 26 times 10 which is uh, 6760 which seems quite a lot but there we go uh, this next one is so he wants to um, use four digits but limit the combinations so we just got to read the question his letter bags now contain the letters A to F so that's A B C D E F which is six so these both will contain six and only contain even numbers greater than zero. Now, these are the same bags as before, so we only had the numbers from zero to nine before. So the even numbers uh, that are greater than zero, so it's two, four, six, eight. So there's four combinations. So there's four numbers those can be. And so find out how many different passwords um, if they're arranged like this. So six times four times four times six. So six times four times four times 6 which is 576 now that might seem confusing that there's an extra um, digit to the password and yet less combinations but if you think about it there's significantly less letters and less numbers um, so that's why it's a much lower number than part a okay so this looks like quite a complicated question um, the important part of this question actually is this bit here now this looks like it's trying to give you a little bit of help, actually it gives you a huge amount of help. It's basically telling you that when you add them together, the common denominator will just be a quadratic. Now it might be tempting just to multiply all of this by all of this and kind of get a cubic equation, but actually the answer is saying no don't do that, the bottom will work uh, if you factorise it. So what we need to do is factorise the one on the right and hopefully we will notice something about it. So we've got videos on how to factorise quadratics where A is more than one um, and it's quite a unique method but I'm going to go for it quickly but please use the videos for a kind of slower exp explanation. So what I do is I times together the first and last ones, times them together and that gives me 48 and then I've got to find a factor pair of 48 that adds together to make the coefficient of the x. So 2 and uh, 24 won't work, uh, 3 and 16. So then I rewrite the 19x as 16 and 3, 3 and 16 doesn't matter. You get the same, you get the same answer eventually either way. Then I just look at these two and factorise them linearly and I just factorise those two linearly so 8x squared plus 16x so I can divide out an 8x and 3x plus 6x I can divide out a 3 and you notice that the bracket here is the same then you pair up the bracket that's the same with the bits on the outside, so you get 8x plus 3 and x plus 2. Cool. So I can rewrite that. Now I'm going to rewrite the question. So now it becomes 1 over 8x plus 3 x plus 2 plus 1 over x plus 2. Now you notice that actually that bracket is the same. So all I need to do is times top and bottom here by 8x plus 3. I'm squishing in a little bit. And it will have a common denominator. Right, so um, I'm going to rewrite that just to make sure my working out is really clear. So top the top becomes 8x plus 3. And the bottom actually is the same as the other side, which is good because now we can add the tops together. So if we add the 1 to the 8x plus 3, we get 8x plus 4. And then we've got 8x plus 3, and then x plus 2. And that's my answer. Looking at the structure of the answer, it looks very much like we're going to have to um, complete the square. Now, to complete the square, we need x squared minus something. Okay, 
Now we've got 2x squared, and sorry, minus something x. We've got 2x squared minus 28x. So we're close to getting that, but we haven't quite got that. So what we need to do is factorize the 2 out first. So 2 brackets x squared minus 14x. And then I'm just going to add the minus 4 at the end. You could also factorize out the, um, the 4 as well, but I'm just going to leave that alone because I'll deal with that later. Now that we've got what we need to be able to complete the square, which is the x squared minus something x, we are going to complete the square. Now to complete the square, and I'm going to do this over here to show you a little bit easier. What you need to do is you need to put the x minus half of the bit here. So it's going to be 7 squared. Now that will get, if you expand that, that will be, or using foil, that will be x squared minus 7x minus 7x um, plus 49. Now we need the x squared, we need the minus 7x minus 7x to get the minus 14x, but we want to get rid of the plus 49 that it generates. So we need to take away 49 from it. And that's it, that's, comple that's um, completing the square. Okay, so I'm going to replace that with what I've just found out that it is, x minus 7 squared minus 49. Now, I have that minus 49 on the inside of the brackets, and I want to collect that with the minus 4 on the outside of the brackets. So I'm going to just expand the big brackets. So I'm going to times the x minus 7 squared by 2. And I'm going to times the minus 49 by 2. And so I can collect the numbers together. So looking at the question, it says it wants m. m is the thing before the brackets, so m is going to be 2. Now it says that p is a positive. Well, we know that p is minus 7, so I'm going to put minus 7 there. And q, it says, is a positive. Well, we know it's a negative, so it's going to be negative 102. This is um, a question about iteration, and question A is a little bit harder maybe than the exam will go, where it asks you to come up with your own iteration formula. So, in order to do this, it says that fx equals zero uh, for this formula. So the first step is just to get it equal to zero. Now the question's given you a hint because it says that it involves a cube root. So we know that we're going to have x cubed equals something and um, and then we're going to cube root both sides. So I'm going to just put my lines down. And we're going to add x and add 5 both sides. And we're just going to cube root both sides. So our iteration formula is going to be the cube root of x plus 5. Now, with the iteration formula, it's a beautifully simple idea that this formula will, as long as we just keep plowing in what we've found for the answer before, it will get us closer and closer to the real root. Now, sometimes the roots are infinite. Uh, so we could be sitting there all day and it will get a closer and closer and closer answer. This is why the question will say, oh, three decimal places or four decimal places. So that will tell us when to stop. So it always will give you a first one, okay, the x0, the first one to try. And all you're going to be doing is putting that one into this formula here. Okay, so let's try it. So cube root of... 1 plus 5 and that gets me 1.81712 blah 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 okay now I need to keep that answer so what I'm going to do is I'm going to press uh, the cube root button then I'm going to click inside the root I'm going to click answer plus 5 
and the calculator will remember the answer to the one we had before. Now, if you try and round them, you will get very, very different answers, um, and it might take you a little bit longer, or you might make a mistake. So, you let the calculator do all the remembering for you. Then I press equals, and I get one point eight nine six one two blah blah blah. So I'm going to do the same again. So I'm going to do the cube root button, answer plus five. And we've got 1.9034, blah, blah, blah. Cube root button, answer plus five. And we've got 1.9040, blah, blah, blah. Now, we're looking for three decimal places, so the numbers we're looking for being the same are these ones here. Now, we've almost got them the same, but we're not quite there, so we need to do another one. So, cube root, answer, plus five, and we've got 1.9041, blah, blah, blah. Now, even if you were to carry on going, the first digits, the digits I've circled with the, well, I've put a red square around, are going to remain the same. So as soon as you get two that are the same to three decimal places, that is your answer. So my answer is going to be 1.904. Now, obviously we haven't got it perfect, but if you carry on the iteration, um, you won't ever get anything different to 1.904. The only numbers that will change are beyond that. So that's why we can confidently stop now and say, yes, that's our answer. The first thing to notice with this question is that um, to find a distance of a velocity time graph, you've got to work out the area underneath the curve. Now, at A-level, there are much easier ways of doing this. But we at GCSE have to do this using the trapezium rule. Now, the trapezium rule goes as follows. You're going to carve that curve, or the underneath of that curve, up into trapeziums to try and estimate, and this is what it asks us to do, the area underneath it, therefore the distance. So, it says it will always give you hints about what it wants you to do. So it gives us a hint saying that it wants it between 2 and 10, but it wants it in four equal intervals. So if I do 2 and 10, so we can get started. Now let's have a look and see how many squares there are in between them. There's 8. So if we want four equal intervals, we're probably going to go up in 2s. So let's try 2s and hopefully it will work nicely. Now we haven't created trapeziums yet, so let's create trapeziums now. So we're going to create trapeziums for these four. There we go. Okay, let's try and get the heights of these trapeziums. And I normally draw it onto the graph itself, it's a little bit easier to get my head around. So that's, I think that's 11. I think that's uh, 6. I think the height of this one is probably, because I've drawn it badly, I think it's 3. The uh, height of this one is 2, and the height of this one I think is 3. And the width of them is 2, so all of them is 2. Okay, so we need to remember how to work out the area of a trapezium. It's half A plus B H. Now this is quite misleading because H actually using the trapezium rule is the width of the trapezium. It's because the trapeziums are kind of on their side. So H is always going to be 2 for these. So what I would do is just number the, the trapeziums that I'm doing. So I'm going to do number 1. Now number 1 is going to be half 11 plus 6 because A and B are the ones on the left and right of the trapezium times 2. And I can use my calculator for this, so it's going to be 17 divided by 2 times 2. Oh, I don't know why I'm dividing by 2 and times it by 2. It's just going to be 17, because the half and the 2 will cancel out. So the second one is going to be half, and this time it's 6 plus 3 times 2. 
Well, we know the half and the two will cancel out, so that's just going to be nine. The third one, the third trapezium, and if you want to, you can actually just number them on the actual thing itself to show the examiner, yep, this is the one I'm trying to work out. So that's going to be half, and what is it this time, three plus two times two, which is just going to be five. Let's just scroll it down a little bit. So the fourth one is going to be half 2 plus 3 times 2, which is also going to be 5. So to work out the total distance, 7 plus 9 plus 5 plus 5, that's uh, 17, sorry. So 17 plus 9 plus 5 plus 5. I don't know why I'm using a calculator for this as well, but it's here, so we might as well use it. So it's going to be 36. Now commonly with this question you're also asked whether it's an overestimate or underestimate. If you have a look at the trapezium, this bit here and this bit here, we've counted that as area and actually there's little thin strips down here. We've counted as area that actually isn't area. So this one will be an overestimate. If your trapezium goes the other way and it doesn't quite hit the curve, then it's going to be an underestimate. Okay, so this doesn't seem like the easiest questions because there's three shapes going on. There's um, no numbers in it at all and we're asked to find a formula. So the first place I'd start is working out, well, first of all, what are the formulas we'll need? Well, let's have a look. So we've got a hemisphere. And some of these formulas you will be given. So a hemisphere is um, a volume of a sphere and then halved. So instead of 4 over 3, I can just say 2 over 3, which is half of 4 over 3, pi r cubed. The uh, cone that we've got is going to be 1 third pi r squared h. And then the cylinder we have is the um, area of the circle times the height. Okay, now we need to find out what the bits are. So for the hemisphere, we just need R. Well, that's quite simple because R is just going to be X. It's the radius of the hemisphere. Okay, now what's more difficult is to work out the height of the cone. Well, if the radius across to the right is x, the radius of the circle up is also going to be x. So we know the height of the um, cone is going to be 4x because one of those x's is used on the hemisphere. We know the radius of the cone is going to be x because it's stated at the top. So let's keep going. The radius of the cylinder is going to be 10x and the height is just labeled as h so that's nice and simple okay now let's have a look at what this question is saying it's saying that this thing here is going to be melted down and is going to be used to create this so that's just saying that the volumes are going to be the same so if i add the volume of the hemisphere to the volume of the cone, it should equal the volume of the cylinder. Okay, so we know that hemisphere plus the cone volume, and I should write volume here, show the examiner that I'm working with volumes, equals the volume of, I don't know why I wrote an S, my goodness, C for cylinder, wow. I'm a maths teacher, right, cylinder, there we go. So hemisphere is um, two-thirds pi, and we said that x was the radius, so x cubed, brilliant. So plus the cone, now what did we say the height of the cone was? We said the height of the cone was 4x. So it's going to be one-third pi x squared because the radius is x and is it 4x let's double check that always double check yeah it is okay so the cylinder 
and I'm going to leave that up so I can see it, is pi, and what's the r? So pi times 10x squared, and all of that squared, because all of that is r, times the height, so times h. Okay, so this is the formula we've got to work with. I'll put my lines down. Okay, so what we got? Let's let's sort out the times this first, and let's tidy this up. So that hasn't got any times as in it. This we're timesing it by four, so it's going to be four thirds pi, and I'm timesing it by x, so it's going to be x cubed. This one I'm doing the ten x squared, so I need to square the ten and the x, so it's going to be a hundred. And let's do the pi next, pi, and it's going to be x squared h. Okay. Now, if you notice on the left-hand side, these two here are the same. They're both pi x cubed. So we can just add them together. So it's going to be 2 thirds plus 4 thirds. So that's going to be 6 thirds or just 2. So it's going to be 2 pi x cubed equals 100 pi x squared h. Brilliant. Okay. Now let's just check to see what it wants. It wants a formula of h in terms of x. So it wants h equals. Okay. So first thing I need to do, well, let's have a look. What's easy to do? Well, what's easy to do is just divide both sides by pi. Let's get rid of the pi's. So 2x cubed equals 100x squared h. Now we want h on its own, so we're getting close. We need to divide by the x squared first to get, x, to get h on its own. So I'm going to divide by x squared, so we get 2x equals 100h. So we can already see we're really close. So to get h on its own, we need to divide both sides by 100. And that's going to be 2x over 100 equals h, or h equals, and we can cancel the 2 and the 100. We can divide them both um, by 2, equals x over 50. So our answer is h equals x over 50. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please click like, and if you really enjoyed it, please click subscribe. Um, also, make sure to check out our website. Our website has a lot more on it, um, and you can just revise anything you want. Um, finally, very, very good luck for those of you doing the resets in November, and I hope you get the result you want. Thank you very much.